open up, up, open up, shut it down like a pack. Say no to the services and work harder at home, or say yes to the services because additional help can't hurt them. So. Hello to all of you positive parents. I'm down the BCBA mom and welcome back to my channel. Okay, so today we have a very special guest in our internet home today. And he is welcome in my home anytime because she is just phenomenal with my kids. Okay, I just don't trust anybody with my kids. Director of Children's Ministry, um, 911. Like, she is a expert. Danny, she is curriculum content creator for homeschool specifically to this video she is an early interventionist so this is going to be really really good i want to introduce we should be close to friends if you so welcome to our internet home nice okay so for those of us who don't know um mm because -hmm. uh, i still have questions myself what is an early intervention specialist and what is it that you do? Early intervention specialists are trained educators or therapists who work with your kids from ages zero to three to help improve physical skills, cognitive skills, communication skills, self-help, and social emotional skills. Close. That's how you have put on your fingers. Two and one. Open, close. Open. Close. Close. Open. Close. Open. All right, try inside. Okay. Here I go. What are some of the qualifying, some of the prerequisites that a doctor would recommend an early intervention? You said a diagnosis. What are some of the typical diagnoses? Um, so, a lot of red flags for autism. You'll see a lot of speech delay. So, um, I have a few children that are either just mute altogether or they can't pronounce certain sounds or words. Parents usually will go to their pediatrician um, when those things are like signs or red flags are there, as well as if they're on feeding tubes, if they were born with um, certain defects, they'll start you off right away with early intervention, knowing that you're gonna have a little more challenge than the typical child. And so therefore it's like, oh, let's get ahead of it before we reach the point of they're two and not walking. In first grade, they can't sit at a desk. And so a lot of that is what the purpose of the early intervention is. And so when I see um, families, typically it is the lack of speech. So I think that's the main thing where parents are like, oh, I went in because my kid wasn't talking or they weren't babbling or, you know, when we read books, they wouldn't sit. Or if we were out in public, they would scream and fall to the floor and I never knew what to do. Mm -hmm. So when I brought it up to the pediatrician, they said, hey, let's start them or get them referred to EI and see if they qualify. That's really good. So speech is one of those big red flags that we all can kind of catch right away. It's observable, it's measurable. Again, language happens at different levels. Some kids are coming out talking and before sentences and they have a full vocabulary while others are like you know they receive more than they give out and so the expressive language they is higher they receive more than they yes. give out that's also very important Absolutely. receptive language is so important even if you can't speak a word i work with a lot of individuals children and adults that mm -hmm. are nonverbal. but if their receptive language is strong they can still thrive yes so it's super in early intervention. One of the tools we use is sign language. Signs I'm excited because it helps. So if I can understand you, but I can say in short, Hey, I need help. Then I'll tell you, I need help. EI is more. If they want more of something, give me more. So I think like those signs of, yes, I hear you. I'm looking for your voice. Um, I'm shaking a rattle and they, they're looking for the rattle. Like, you know, that they're receiving something. A lot of early intervention is working with the parent. And so okay. it's basically me as a developmental therapist teaching the parent how to help develop their child, if that all makes sense. So it's not um, your job to develop their child. It's your job to equip them with the yes, skills absolutely. to facilitate these developmental milestones. Because we're only there like 45 to an hour a week. And so if you're with your child way more than that, but I've showed you the tools, it's kind of that 
um, that expression where it's like you teach a man to fish. Mm -hmm. So it's like now I've given you the tools on how to get your kid to talk, to sit longer, to um, engage, to make eye contact. And if you're doing that over time and as mm -hmm. we grow in our sessions, now they've mastered that, let's go to the next goal. How do we do this? And then we go with that. Your skin is glowing, by the way. Oh, thank you. That's that black girl magic. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you mentioned early intervention is ages zero to three. Yes. So what happens when a kid ages out of early intervention, but there is still some obvious deficits in some mm -hmm. areas, and they still may need some, some help? So a part of early intervention is creating an IFSP, which is an individualized family support plan. So once they come off of there at three, then we transfer that over to an IEP in the public school. And that's what we would handle. Okay. So yes. I see how it's piecing together. Typically, we work with CPS school. So whatever, speech and occupational therapy. In and, the schools. In the schools. Oh, and so, when, so it'll follow you. Yes. So you in can. In the school. Inside the school. Got so it. when you drop your kid off for school that day, they're getting those services while they're in school. So we can do at home, we can do at daycare centers. Um, oh, I've gone into both. Okay. And both, I think, are impactful. At home, especially because it helps the parents parent. But then at school, it helps the teacher teach. Teach. So we just want to kind of normalize the conversation of therapy. Like, therapists can look like us. We can look just like your moms and have are your best interests at heart as well want the best for your child want to support you in every way and it just not be a scary or intimidating thing Open up. what would you say to a mom or a parent or a grandmother who may sense that there is some or there may be some delays in some areas but they're just not confident in what the next step should be they're not familiar with the terms like developmental therapist mm -hmm. or early intervention what would you say to those individuals i think my first thing which i always try to reassure parents is you are the expert at your child it's true and so if you have noticed a sign or you have a concern i say be the advocate for your child and so if your infant can't speak, you can speak for them. And so something going on here. And I just say, even if a doctor says, hey, we think this is a concern, get the eval, get the assessment, see what it is. And if it's something where you're like, well, no, this isn't often, or this is just, you know, sporadic that they, they did or didn't do certain things while, you know, new people were there and they were getting tested. Then I say either say no to the services and work harder at home or say yes to the services because additional help can't hurt them. So I think that's my starting point. So I think the full team helps, but I also do believe that as a parent. What is the full team? You mentioned that. So children can qualify for multiple disciplines inside of early intervention. They can get occupational therapy. They can get speech therapy. They can get developmental therapy. They can get physical therapy, social workers, and they have feeding specialists and therapists. They have art therapists. There's a lot of stuff wow. that you can get through early intervention. Um, I think, again, not every child is gonna qualify for everything. everything. Right. And so maybe you went in for speech. Maybe they said, hey, we seen some sensory issues here. Let's put an occupational therapist on the, on the team. So it's not, scarier it doesn't mean it's scarier mm -hmm. because you have more therapies that's just like that's great it's just like i'm having more coffee yeah like who doesn't want more coffee i also think um and i'll hear a lot of parents say from different backgrounds that it's like a stigma with their their society or their community yes. and so a lot of parents are like oh my parents don't agree with us mm -hmm. therapy. but what i encourage a lot of my families to do is well take the word therapy out of it I come over to play. I come over, yes. you know, to, to teach. So some of my parents will say, oh, your teacher's here. Yeah. You know, so it's, you have an individualized opportunity to point in on whatever skills your children are lacking in in this moment, and we can work on it. And once they master that, then we work on the next thing. Isn't that what teachers do? Mm -hmm. Like teachers are now here to say, hey, you don't know this. Let me teach you. Let me help you. And the overall goal is the entire team, mom, dad, you know, the babysitter, the nannies, and whoever else, grandparents who are keeping the children, can all come in and say, hey, we worked on those things that your teacher came over to do last yeah. week, and look what they can do. And so it's like, take the word therapist out of it. Take the word developmental out of it, because 
honestly we're all developing at some rate somehow and so so true here we are yes and we all have neurological differences. Mm -hmm. No one brain is wired the same way. So I, I like that tactic and that can help ease that stigma mm -hmm. to say, and you know what? I used to do this. Um, so my son has music therapy. And for years I would just call it music class because I felt like that made my parents feel comfortable. It made it more of a comfortable topic when I was talking about it. Now I've made the conscious effort to break the stigma, so I'm calling it what it is because I want it to be received mm -hmm. the way that it is. It's helpful, it's therapeutic, it's it's good, it's healing, it's all of these things and I don't want my son to ever feel like it's shame or anything like that. But that came with progress. So I was that mom that was like, uh, I'm gonna do it, but I'm not gonna tell yeah. anybody. <laughs> Whatever your level is, whatever your progress is, that's fine. Just get get the assistance, get the help, get the assessments, get the evaluation, um, because it's not gonna hurt. None of these things are restrictive. None of these things are invasive, right? None of these things are taking away the autonomy of a child. All of these things are just helping and supporting and just pouring yep. into the child. So what? are some of the things moms can do at home if they are seeing some of these signs and they kind of want to get ahead of it as a tool to use at home to stay up to um, well informed i guess i would say with what's going on with your child then maybe using what we call the ages and stages questionnaire and so mm -hmm. in working in child care we used it we did home visits with it okay. just basically some simple stuff like oh my kid is this many months this are they doing these things okay and so at the end of the questionnaire you'll get a better scope of hey maybe we should work more on tummy time because he oh. isn't lifting his head or you know maybe you have a two-year-old who he's not using his fork properly maybe we need to work on giving him more utensils because we feed him so you know why would he know how to hold the of fork course. properly? so yeah. and it's not necessarily a sense of oh they're behind when you see whatever the end results of it is but it, it lets you know what more you should work on mm -hmm. but I, I say even with that use it in congruence with going to your pediatrician okay. um because it will then get the conversation going so, but i mean kids are gonna grow at whatever pace they're gonna grow but to stay up up to speed on your kid to be the expert on your child then you do do those things where you look at the asq and you say all right, this is what we need to work on. Maybe we need to read more books at bedtime. Maybe we need to, you know, play with more cars or buy in a play kitchen so we can do some pretend play mm. to increase social skills or whatever the case may be. That is good. Good information. I believe in centers, you'll have the proper tools. I think one for safety, two for resources, mm. and three just for everybody to come together at some point to say, hey, we've been working on this. We can do this. Let's see it. So... I like that. Mm -hmm. and, and I can see how that is lacking in certain communities yes. and how maybe growth and development can be stagnant in those areas because of the variables that are yes. just already in place. We don't have those toys at home. We don't have therapists that feel comfortable enough coming to our neighborhood. Um, or I just don't have the space in my house mm -hmm. to do all of that running around. I'm sorry, I'm on the third floor. You better sit your butt down. <laughs> and sometimes that's what we have to deal with. Yeah. And you wonder why um, parents don't follow through with your treatment mm -hmm. plan. It just may not be the right setup for them. That doesn't mean that they don't buy in. Right. It just, you're not able to meet them where they are. So places like a developmental center, something mm -hmm. that you are in the works, Absolutely. you have in the works. It could be like a drop-in therapeutic family building yes. bonding opportunity for coaching and, and all of these things and you can just feel safe and empowered. And I think it takes the pressure off of the parent because if I were a parent and you the therapist came in and said, hey, if your kid played with more puzzles, maybe they'd be blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And now I'm sitting here, if I'm already worried about rent and car note and you know making sure they eat a healthy meal every day now i have to think about how we're going to get more puzzles in the house so my kid can be um i think having centers like that creates an opportunity where all right this is one less thing i have to worry about we can come here we can get what we need we can go home and i know that i've done my job as a parent check and so so like that yeah i think it I it's think about the parents too we yeah. have to be motivated and we have to be 
um, support it because this is not our only job. Mm -hmm. Raising kids is it's one of our most important. It's one of our most draining, but it's not our only job. We mm -hmm. have other things to do. So places like this can meet us halfway and help us feel empowered and not guilty with what Absolutely. we're not doing, but reinforce with what we are doing. Yes. I like that. Huge thank you to Miss Marquia Smith for stopping by and sharing so much knowledge on early intervention. I'm going to link all of her information below along with the ASQ resources. Don't forget to subscribe. Thanks. Bye.